Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. I'm Pastor Witt. This, this is our seventh Sunday at the Epiphany, uh, February 20th, 2022. Uh, wow, the year's already cruising along, isn't it? Won't be long, we'll be in Lent. Uh, it's a great season of the year. We're continuing to, to have our discussion about 1 Corinthians, and uh, we've got some interesting things to talk about today. Again, I hope you're doing well. Hope you're taking care of yourself, being safe, looking forward to the warmer temperatures, people being able to come back to in-person worship more. Thank you for your financial support. Uh, if you're running a little behind, it uh, be great for you to catch up. This is a time of the year where we tend to run a little bit low. And um, if you can do whatever it is that God asks you to do, it will kick us back into the normal range. And um, thanks for your ministry. Thanks for all the things that you do in the name of Christ, the, the people that you care for. Why don't we take a couple moments to center ourselves on Jesus as we begin our worship of God? Let us pray. Amen. Amen. Call to Worship is adapted from uh, Psalm 37. Take delight in the Lord who satisfies the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in God's actions. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for God. The Lord is our salvation and our refuge in times of trouble. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, you spoke your word and revealed your good news in Jesus Christ. Feel your creation with that word again so that by proclaiming your joy, your promises to all the nations, and help us to sing of your glorious hope to all the people. May we become one of the living body today, your incarnate presence on the earth. Amen. 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 Our scripture lesson today is taken. Uh, as I said, we're working our way through um, 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, verses 35 through 38, and 42 through 50. Some skeptic is sure to ask, Paul says, show me how the resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do have similar experiences in gardening. You plant a dead seed and soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visual likeness between the seed and the plant. You could never guess what a tomato is going to look like by looking at a seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it don't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection of the body that comes from it will be dramatically different. The image of the plant a dead seed and a rising, raising living plant is, is a mere sketch at best. But perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body, but only 
if you keep in mind that when we are raised, we are raised for good, alive forever. The corpse that's planted is not beauty, but when it's raised, it's glorious. Put it in the ground weak, it comes up powerful. Sow it natural, the seed's grown and is supernatural. Same seed, same body, but what a difference from when it goes in, in the physical mortal, and when it raises up in the spiritual immortality. We follow this sequence in scripture. The first Adam received life. The last Adam is a life-giving spirit. Physical comes first, then spiritual. A firm base shaped from the earth. A final completion coming out of heaven. The first man was made of earth and people, sense, are the same. The second man was made of heaven and people now are heavenly. In the same way that we worked from our earthly origins, let us embrace our heavenly ends. I need to emphasize, friends, that our nature, earthly lives, don't in themselves lead us to the way to the very nature into the kingdom of God. Their very nature is to die. So how could they naturally end up in the life kingdom? A written word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, help us to hear you today to... Um, to be filled with the hope that comes from understanding that this is not all there is and yet this is where we begin our celebration of what is to come in your holy name amen you know prior to this reading um, Paul defends resurrection rather staunchly the opening of 1 Corinthians 15, we talked about it this past week. I, I, I kept wondering why Paul is so vehement about his, um, about his desire that people understand that resurrection is there. Because I thought that there's another argument that could be made uh, if people didn't want to believe in resurrection. But then suddenly I realized that there were a lot of folks in his day that didn't believe in resurrection. The whole Sadducee group, they were so sad, you see, because there was no life after death um, and some other things. But um, the main thing was there was no life after death. The Pharisees believed in life after death. The Sadducees, so sad you see, because there is no life after death, did not. And so maybe Paul is making this vehement kind of an argument and... Um, Maybe he's trying to, to break through that shell that exists. And then I thought about today the number of people that still don't believe in resurrection. And I thought, well, maybe this argument really does need to be made. Um, though I'm one of those persons that really doesn't believe that I need to argue with other people about theology. That never seemed to make sense to me. Nor was I one of those folks that wanted to present my theology without hearing other people's theology. That never made any sense to me either. I want to talk with people, to listen, to hear what people have read, so that I can determine if there's any validity or if I just simply need to put it on a back burner for a while and let it stew so that it may change me in the future. There have been things that, that over a long period of time have changed me. There have been things that have sat there and never did touch me. Um, I don't know, I guess if I had a, a recommendation for you, I would recommend that for you. So today we're going to take a look at resurrection. Uh, Paul turns his attention in the second half of, of chapter 15 to what kind of a body people come back with in resurrection. 
does the resurrection, um, does it interest you? What kind of body you're going to have, does that interest you? I talked with a bunch of folks this week, and a couple of them were like, no, not really. But a sizable number of them seem to be very interested about having a discussion about the resurrection. I did a lot of reading this week, uh, four or five different guys, and uh, Kyle Fedler, um, I want to give you a couple of his thoughts. He says, look, the relationship between the body and salvation was a source of great tension for the Corinthians. Uh, and, you know, I suspect for a lot of other people in that area then, and I know that it still does today. The entirety of this thing that's called 1 Corinthians, that, that we've titled 1 Corinthians, obviously it wasn't titled 1 Corinthians when it was written, but since then it's been titled that, is a discussion, one topic after another, trying to get the people at Corinth to rebalance their faith in Christ and God. Paul had sort of come to the conclusion that these guys were, were not really being as serious about their faith as they need to be. And quite frankly, anybody that's in charge of any church or any, I suspect, any district superintendent or bishop or anyone who, who has a group of folks that they work with, they have those same kind of thoughts. And so as you work your way through 1 Corinthians, um, you can feel the tension that's going on and how it builds. And, and Paul increases in tone of irritation all the way to the fact where he gets really... If you read this in, in different translations, this uh, 15th chapter, you'll find one of them where, where Paul actually you know, says, listen, if you question this, you're fools! Exclamation point. Well, that's, that's funny. Um, his followers are beginning to, to go off track into different things or are being affected by other faith systems. Um, you've seen this around you. You've seen this very thing where people get, they get irritated with this or that or they get beguiled by this or that and the next thing you know they're running off to a different faith community, to a different faith system. Uh, there were those known as the spiritualists or the uh, enthusiastics. And they were abusing their body, bodies through debauchery and through sexual immorality uh, by misusing the understanding of grace that they had already been forgiven. And so they could just tear this thing up and it really didn't matter because they were going to get a new one on the other side. And they were saying that the temporal state really just doesn't matter. You know, some believed in uh, reductionistic materialism that we get exactly the same body on the other side, and others were believing in anthropological dualism, which says that there's a physical body and a spiritual body, and we trade one in and we get the other. Neither of these did Paul ascribe to. All of this really bothered Paul. Paul doesn't see the body as evil. There are certain theological groups that actually see the physical body as an evil thing. Paul disagreed. Um, nor does he see us as being raised only in the spirit on the other side. And so Paul gets into this trying to, to get folks to first off believe in resurrection and then secondly to understand that there is a relationship between this and that body but that they're different and he begins to to talk to a very agrarian people when I say agrarian I'm not talking about uh, people that garden um, when Elizabeth and I were first married and, and I went out and did some hunting and brought home um, some meat. Um, she got very kind of uptight about, you know, having this piece of meat that I brought home. And, um, and I said to her, I said, sweetheart, where do you think meat comes from? And she said, under plastic from the grocery store. Well, I was talking with somebody this past week and they said, you know, we're so far away from where things come from that we don't even have a good sense for it at all. 
he said there there are a lot of people that have never gardened there are certainly a lot of people that have never hunted or fished or been involved in farming in any way i got to thinking about that and i thought wow that's that's really true there there are a sizable number of folks that have never had that experience of the life and death of things that bring life and death for us. Probably another subject uh, for another day, but these were highly agrarian people. And what I mean by that is they understood seeds and plants and animals and milk, goats, making cheese, catching fish, going to the market. They understood this. And so when Paul picks up this, um, this thing about seeds, uh, you know, he, he's really stepping into something that's very, very common for them in a vernacular that they understand quite clearly and quite well. Uh, my second church, there was a, a guy there named Lau Steger, uh, who's gone on to be with the Lord now. Phenomenal guy, very, very bright guy. Um, he made, I think it was 10 patents when he was just early in his life and sold them. Um, he told me for a million bucks a piece. I don't have any reason to disbelieve him, but he went and bought his granddaddy's farm around the town, and uh, he began to grow stuff. And he used to talk. I mean, I mean, if I had this conversation one time with him in five years, I had that conversation uh, maybe a dozen times. Um, he said, "You know, seeds are an amazing thing." He says, "Have you ever considered?" He he had a big giant. 55 gallon drum of uh, corn that you could put it in the ground and grow it and when it comes up you could strike some of the corn off and you'd be able to replant it. You may not know but you can't do that with regular corn today. It's all been genetically engineered not to be able to be planted again. He had some, anyway, some strange ideas about why we needed to make sure <coughs> that we were able to do that. But he would say to me, he'd say, um, Pastor Witt, uh, you know, have you ever considered that you drop a kernel of corn into the ground and you don't do anything else to it? And you walk back months later and that one seed has produced all the rest of this. And he used to talk about that all the time. He talked about the church. He said, you know, the church is an amazing thing. He said, have you ever considered that, that people a hundred years ago bought a building, bought a piece of land, built a building, and, and then you know, they paid 10000 or whatever it was for it. And over the past 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, whatever it is, he said, have you ever considered how many Easter celebrations have done there? How many weddings? How many funerals? How many baptisms? How many, you know, Sunday school class? He would just go on and on. And he said, what an investment that this one little small thing grows into this great big thing. He had a very good understanding about the concept that I think Paul is trying to bring to us that... Um, well, Paul insists that, you know, what is brought forth as a result of sowing the seed obviously is not the same as the seed itself. He says, look, it's a resurrection body. A seed, when it's sown, produces something new, something different. I think he's correct. Um, the resurrection body is something different. So, he, you know, so since we await our own death, uh, what he would call our own sowing, Paul believed that we, what we needed to do is that we needed to live into the glory in our present body as we were awaiting the new one to come, awaiting to die. That we needed to live in our present body into the glory. Now see, I would have some other ways of saying that. I would say that, that we need to live into our baptism and be living into our resurrection. I would use a word called regeneration. Paul seems to make a very clear distinction between life according to the flesh, or nature, as he would call it, or life according to the spirit. You can go check chapter 5, 19 to 26. One leads to death. The other leads to life. Paul says an attitude towards the flesh and blood has no place really with God. I find that interesting. I'd love to talk with him about that. Um, 
I think he's overstating his, uh, his argument there, but he says one is dust and one is heaven. You know, in just a few days, we're going to be celebrating uh, Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is one of those uh, celebrations in the church that, that I really like. Um, <laughs> we, we take ashes that have been made from the palms last year and we put them on people's foreheads and we say the words, from dust you come and unto dust you shall return. Or from earth you come and unto earth you shall return. Um, I like that thought process. I like, I like to be reminded that what I am is not yet what I will be. I don't know about you, but I've changed so much from when I've been, well, obviously from when I was a kid up, but since I joined the church, since I can reach back in my mind not very far until I was about 10 years old, it's about as far back as I can go, remembering going to church and, and through my teens and being baptized and then the confirmation uh, with a whole bunch of folks and then meeting God personally uh, a few years later um, and, and the different times that I've been on uh, spiritual journeys, one of which was an Emmaus walk, several of which were before that, which were far more um, powerful for me than the Emmaus. But, but I had a buddy who went on an Emmaus walk and, and it changed his life. He never realized before that people loved him like they did. Um, it's thought process that, that we're moving from one place to another and that it's going to come to a close. But when it does, it's not going to be the end. There's going to be more. I like that. Diane Lipset, she indicates that, that Adam followed the way of sinful nature and that Christ followed the way of the Spirit. And Paul rejected the view that the body was inherently evil. I want you to hear this. Paul rejected the view that the body is inherently evil. There are those that teach that the world is evil. I think Paul's correct. I, I, think, that's I think that thought process is incorrect. The issue is not the existence of, but the control by spirit or nature. The issue is not the existence of nature or spirit, but rather the control by spirit or nature. I don't know about you, but what I have been doing over the past many years is transforming myself from allowing the natural side of me, to use his terminology, the power that the natural side and the control that the natural side has over me, transforming it over to the spiritual side. And my relationship with Christ is bringing me closer, I believe, to what it was that I was originally intended to be. Christ's resurrection body, she said, is, is both like and unlike his earthly body. I, I spent some time thinking about that this week, about the spiritual body. And I got to thinking about the different times. And I was reminded of this, the stories of the... The Mountain of Transfiguration. By the way, next Sunday's Transfiguration Sunday, but probably what brought it up in mind. But the, you know, Jesus goes up on the hill with a couple of his boys, and then we got the cloud coming in. We got Moses and Elijah showing up. Um, now, how everyone knew that, it, you know, did they shake hands, you know, you know, hello, hello, hello. I don't think so, uh, but maybe. But even Jesus seems to be kind of transformed into something else. Transfigured is the word that we use. He's transfigured into something else. I got to thinking about Jesus at the, uh, at the garden tomb. How is it that Mary doesn't know him? Now, for many years what I said is that Mary's crying and because she's crying her eyes are tear filled and that causes her not to be able to see Jesus. And maybe so. But well, maybe there's something more to this. 
maybe Jesus doesn't look exactly like he did. Now, consider the upper room. You know, Jesus proved himself to those guys by eating something and then by showing the holes that he has in his hands, his feet, his side, his, his wrists. His, Jesus shows these things. Well, I've often thought, I don't need to see the holes in somebody to know who they are. If I've spent time with them, don't I know them? And yet, this new Jesus has the ability to do things that the old Jesus, I presume, did not have, which was to walk through doors. This new body is different. On the road to Emmaus, the two guys that, that are walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus, it's not until he breaks the bread that evening, and that is a great, great story. I, I would highly recommend that you go and just read it. Um, it's going to be a part of the newsletter that's coming out here in a few weeks. Um, that story is just a great story that that they're talking about the, this terrible thing that's happened, and Jesus says, so what things are you talking about? You know, And they're like, what, are you the only guy that doesn't know about this stuff? And they begin to say, and then Jesus begins to tell them why it is that this had to happen. They still don't see him. Until that evening when they convince him to stay, and he does stay, and he takes bread and breaks it. And in that moment, suddenly they understand who he is. It so lights them up that in the middle of the night, well, you'd say, what's the big deal? Uh, they didn't have street lights. That's the big deal. They turn and head all the way back to Jerusalem and go back and see the boys that are in the upper room. They, they share this thing. Paul in 1 Corinthians is battling with a group called the Strong who claim to have superior knowledge, superior status, and consider themselves to be gifted. The problem is many other people in the congregation considered them to be the strong, the knowledgeable, and the gifted, and were following them, and were leaving. And Paul argues, listen, we can't see through normal experimentation methods how to find a solution to this resurrection thing. These strong people were making some arguments and, G and Paul says, listen, it's just like the concept of sowing. He says, we sow what is to be raised. Sowing leads naturally to the resurrection, to the raising of the plant. Uh, it's, it's interesting to me that he talks about the, the seed dying and being planted. Um, I hesitate to open this up, but I'm just going to crack it for you and let you look inside and then think about it this week. My contention is that the seed's not fully dead. The seed contains the spark of life that comes back. And my contention is that though the body die, there is that spark of life that's inside of us that comes back. If you go to, um, Paul contrasts the natural body to that of the spiritual body. If you go in the Jerusalem Bible uh, to verse 30, 44 and read it, it says, when it is sown, it embodies the soul. And when it is raised, it embodies the spirit. You know, if we want to go and get into the thought process of the Greeks and different peoples along the way, uh, we can begin to parse this thing out in different directions. It's just, I find it interesting to talk about soul, natural, and spirit, and we tend to... Paul indicates the natural precedes the supernatural. Adam precedes Jesus. And we begin as the image of Adam in our conception and we move toward that of the image of Christ through prevenient grace, justification, sanctification, grace, through, through being baptized and living into our baptism. He says that we utterly become that which resembles Christ. And um, I would say to you that that is that great theological term that I fell in love with years ago. 
uh, regeneration, where we are being regenerated into our original intended created state without the sinful nature, which causes us to be called natural. Um, you and I are on a great journey. This journey is fraught with uh, all kinds of things. And occasionally we bump into things that create some angst for us. But I say to you that um, from all that we have, from all that we are on our journey, we're living inside of sin and we're moving toward, we're moving from that into living in some kind of resurrection. Um, I'm in the beginning process of that. You're in the beginning process of that. I want to say to you that, that I believe that John Wesley was correct, that what we need to do as we move from where we are to where we're going, that in that process that, that we, we turn our attention from that of the things of that would um, that would impede our understanding of God and our becoming what God created us to be and begin to move more and more and more as a person who is living into their baptism, living into their resurrection, moving on to sanctification and becoming a person who lives in this world but really is beginning to represent and to resemble something very different. And I believe that your relationship with Christ, your relationship with the church, your relationship with other people, it's going to change you into a resurrected person sometime in the future. And that that person is going to resemble Christ. And the nature, the spiritual nature that you will have at that point will be glorious. I have absolutely no idea what it will look like. I think Paul's right. Seed's about as good as it gets. You plant a seed, it pops up. I was thinking this week about some of my people, some of my friends that have died, some really, really close folks to me. And I was, uh, I picked up the horn and called a good friend of mine, an old district superintendent of mine, uh, a couple days ago. And I said, I just want to call and tell you I love you. And then I was thinking about Danny, her husband. And, um, I said, I changed the vernacular on how I talk about Dan. And because of that, I've changed the vernacular on how I talk about all people who have passed. I no longer say that, or I just simply won't say that I loved Dan with the ED on the end. I said to her, my new way of talking about Dan and all other people because of Dan is that I love him. I love Buzz. I love Dan. I love Frank. Um, I love Julie. I love, I love these people because they did not cease to exist. They're still there. They simply have been moved a little further along than you and I have been. But I tell you, a blink of an eye and we'll be there. And we'll be in the same thing. I want to live in this world in a way that enables other people to see the value of having a relationship with Jesus and moves them into loving God more and getting more of that. I want to take the power that I have and underpin other people. I would hope you do too, but that's your choice. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, help us as we move forward in our faith. Help us to live into your baptism. Help us to live into those powerful Advent words of hope, love, joy, peace, faith, grace. Jesus, thank you for coming into the world and living and teaching. Sorry you had to die, but thank you for doing so, for being resurrected. Thanks for walking through doors and, and just thanks for going up around the lake and having the conversations with the guys around the barbecue. Thanks for the stories that you help pull together in this great book that we call the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me peace and hope and joy and causing me to be more loving. Thank you for your church. Thank you for its ministries. Thank you for those that invest in your church. 
In your holy, holy, and loving name, Jesus, I offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Would you uh, join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Go into the world empowered by the Spirit of God and be people of God who are living in to their baptism. May resurrection begin to be seen upon you now, regeneration of you into your original created state. Amen. Amen. Go and do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming to worship God.